Hi, it's Business Analysis Live. I'm Susan Moore. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at IIBA. And my name is Scott Bennett. I'm the Business Analysis Manager here at the International Institute of Business Analysis. Thank you for joining us today. We've got an interesting topic lined up. We're going to be talking about running effective meetings. The purpose of a meeting is to make decisions. Are your meetings effective? <laughs> I feel like I've been in a lot of meetings that have not been effective. And I think we all know the smells of those, right? There's not an agenda. <laughs> nobody knows why they're there. Uh, you don't get any kind of outcomes. Those are not effective meetings. So we're going to give you, I think, some top five tips, but then we're going to go a little further. And of course, we're live. So we're taking your questions. We want to know, what do you want to know about effective meetings? Yes, and we have a question for you. What's your best meeting tip? So as we go through the chat here, we'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, and where we're going to start is what we think are the five essential elements of effective meetings. So we've got a countdown we're going to do here. Um, so Susan, what was the first one that we want to go through? Well, the first one that we want to go through is objectives. Having an objective for your meeting. And I, I think this one might actually not be something that people think of when they think of starting their meeting preparation, but yeah. this one will all, this actually will set you up in a lot of different ways for not only who, who you're going to invite to the meeting, how long it's going to be, what you're going to do in the meeting, but also if you even need a meeting. So stating the objectives of the meeting. So why don't we unpack that just a little bit? What do we mean by an objective, Scott? Yeah, so we're pulling together some people. It could be a small group of three. It could be a group of 10 or 12. What you want to do is make sure you're using people's time effectively. And as I said before, a meeting is to make decisions. So the objectives basically state this is what we're coming together to do. And it helps set the expectation of what people might need to bring to the meeting, either material or um, some background information they might need to do some research on. An objective is different from outcome. So this is not necessarily the deliverables that you're going to produce or, um, or you know, what, what's going to happen next. But it really is what is the thing that you want to achieve? What's the purpose of your meeting and being really clear on that? So I think that's a, that is a good number one. That's a good number one tip probably in life. Just yeah. have an objective for whatever you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> So our, our second one relates to the objective, and that is to be a little bit more clear on the meeting. And to do that, you need to have an agenda. These are the topics we're going to cover. Um, I've had meetings hit my calendar with no agenda at all, just a very short title, and I'm a little bit confused. Uh, what are we going to be doing here? So as a meeting planner, it's really important to lay out the agenda. It doesn't have to be extremely detailed. It could be as simple as three bullets. But these are the things that we're going to talk through in the meeting. And the reason that that is important, again, is to set the expectation for the meeting, but also if you invite someone who might not necessarily think they can contribute, they might come back and say, I don't think I'm the right person. Maybe you should invite so-and-so. So the agenda gives a little more depth, a little more detail on what you're trying to accomplish so those attendees can really understand what you're looking for. That's, I, I think we've all gotten those meetings where there's no agenda. There's no description of the meeting. And I don't understand at all why I've been invited, right? Um, <laughs> the agenda can make that clear. And it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't have to be a separate artifact that you link in. It can actually be in the body of your meeting. But I do think it helps the people that you've invited to understand why they're attending. And here's, hey, for bonus points, you can also in your agenda identify who you will need for each uh, agenda item on there. That's, Good you idea. know, and, and plan your agenda accordingly so that you get maximum use from everybody. And then, you know, as you're going down the list, you need fewer and fewer people or people know when they need to be ready to speak. So yeah. agendas and getting them out on time. I feel like I got, I got a lot of notes here on agendas, <laughs> getting them out on time, not 10 minutes before the meeting, but 24 hours before the meeting, 12 hours. So people can make some decisions about why do you need me? Am I available? Should somebody else be here instead? That kind of stuff. Yeah. I, my ideal is always to have an agenda when I send out the meeting, but sometimes that's just not realistic the way business works. Uh, we're moving in some fast environments. 
So it's you might want to put a placeholder meeting there. And That's then, right. as you said, throw the agenda in closer to the time. Yeah. So. OK, so let's agenda. talk about the third one on our essential elements list. This one is only invite relevant attendees. And this is important because the larger the group of your meeting, the more difficult it is to keep people on the same page and keep the conversation focused. So the ideal meeting is only enough people to be able to make the decisions that you need. Um, sometimes when I'm getting ready to plan a meeting, I feel like there's a group of people, you know, the ones I'm talking about that have FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. And they say, oh, just include me on all of your meetings. And I think, I, but you may not have a purpose in here. So really thinking through who are the required attendees who absolutely must be here because there is something on this agenda that they have the expertise or the decision-making power to tackle. Then you might have a set of optional attendees and, and still consider these carefully because this isn't just people that wanna come because whatever. Sometimes those optional attendees can really turn your meeting upside down. Yeah. So those optional attendees sometimes can be um, delegates. They could be the backup. If you've got a sponsor that typically is hard to schedule, sometimes I might know who that delegate is and I say, that's gonna be the required person, but I'm also gonna include that decision, that sponsor, just in case they are available. So consider those people, observers, people that are filling other roles. Um, if you if you are going to have these other people, consider what you want them to do before you just put them on the invitation. So this one is important. And I think we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, um, Scott. I also think about inviting people to meetings is um, there's a respect element here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but this is a way that you can show respect or disrespect, by the way. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Number four on the list here, start and end on time. Um, and this is what we consider as essential. Um, if you start on time, uh, people get into an understanding of, hey, I need to be there right when the, the meeting starts. You're not wasting time waiting five minutes for people to show up um, and also ending on time. If you end your meeting on time, that means people can get to the next meeting so they can start on time. Um, so it's respecting people's time in terms of making sure that you're working within the boundaries that you set yourself. Yeah, here's here's where that idea of respecting people's time and just respecting people in general, I think, comes in is when you start and end on time. And hey, look, there's lots of reasons why sometimes we can't start or end on time. And in those cases, it's not about starting abrupt, abruptly or ending abruptly. It could just be about asking permission. Hey guys, I see that we're almost at the end of our time, <clears throat> excuse me. And we're, we're really, we're almost at the end of this topic. <clears throat> Can you give me a few more minutes? So doing things like that are important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then we've got the fifth one on the list here is about taking notes to document decisions and action items. So the purpose of the meeting is to make decisions, document those so that people um, are all on the same page and any action items outstanding. So things such as um, what is the action item, who owns the action item, and what is the due date? Um, be very specific. Um, the worst thing we can do in running a meeting is everyone says, okay, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I'll do this stuff. And there's no follow-up and things drop off. Um, so being organized is an important part of the essentials here. Um, this one, you know, uh, we, uh, we only tend to think about our meetings as just that 30 minutes, one hour of, of what we're doing in the meeting. But, you know, yeah. meetings live on <laughs> well after whatever has happened in that room, virtual room or whatever. And so documenting decisions, I think, is is really crucial. It's a really crucial step here because sometimes people don't remember what's been decided or there's a long time between when the decision was made and when it gets implemented. And so when you take a few moments at the conclusion of your meeting to document those decisions, you've got the record of, of what was decided. And when you put it in a place where people can get back to it, there is a way for them to, to locate it. And hey, look, sometimes you have to remake a decision. So this isn't about, you know, 
hitting somebody over the head. No, we made that decision. That's final. But it is about making sure that you're transparent with those decisions so that everybody is clear so that if you need to make a new decision, you know what the first decision was made on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we've shared what we consider the top five essential elements for effective meetings. But uh, that given saying that, you don't necessarily always have to do these. So for example, if Susan and I were to book a meeting with each other because we're going to talk about our next, next podcast, we don't need an agenda. We know what we're talking about. So just because we listed them as essential doesn't mean you need them every single time. But in terms of best practice, uh, that's what we would suggest including. Yeah. And I think you want to consider those every single time um, and then <clears throat> make a conscious decision of, OK, this particular meeting does not need for me to do this. Or, you know, like we talked about with the time, make sure that you know that you've got how to handle changes in time. So, yeah. all right. So, Susan, we do have some additional elements, but why don't we check in with our live audience and get some questions? And in the meantime, if you're not listening to this live, you're listening to our podcast, please give us a rating on the podcast. Business Analysis Live is the name of it. And if you do have topic suggestions, you're listening off offline, you can email us at live at iiba.org. And uh, we'll certainly take those and put them in our backlog. Yeah. And hey, by the way, it is spring where I am. Uh, it may not be spring every place else. So um, it's beautiful and sunny. And also we are covered in pollen. So that's why I'm a little choked up today. Well, all right. So let's so let's take a look. I think we've got a variety of things here. So we've got some people giving their best meeting tips. And also we've got some questions. So Paul Cash is the first one. Understand the need. Yeah, I think understanding why you should have a meeting is pretty important. Um, and then sure. also a good organizer and a good listener. I, I think, you know, the secret to good communication, as we've as we've talked about in these podcasts, is um, is listening, actually. That's a good way. Yeah, All right. It reminds me hey. of a common phrase that the best person to run a meeting is the busiest person in the room. And the reason that I heard that phrase years ago and it resonated with me is because really busy people don't waste time. Um, mm. They're effective and they're usually organized. So uh, organization, yeah, I agree with that one. Yeah. All right. So Eric has the, has the next question. He asked, how do you feel about recurring large group meetings for 40 plus people? Um, Eric, they make me sad. <laughs> I just think that's a very expensive meeting. Now, you know, we, we may not think about this, but all of us have a particular labor cost. Uh, usually organizations have a, have a figure, you know, based on whatever. Um, and so when I think about 40 people plus in a room for an hour, I think labor cost times the number of people hours, and those get really expensive. I, I, I always bring this book up. It's called The Surprising Science of Meetings. Uh, this is written by a professor here in town, Stephen Rogelberg. He talks Sorry about- to interrupt. You want to hold that up and I'll- uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah, The Surprising Science of Meetings, how you can lead your team to peak performance. If you're an IIBA member, this is in our online library, both as a digital book and as an audio book. Uh, again, kind of nerding out about meetings, but, you know, he estimates that um, bad meetings cost organizations in the billions of dollars annually. So, Eric, that's that's what I think of is I think of how much money are we are we wasting? And, you know, when I worked in um, in an insurance company a long time ago, our CIO was particularly concerned about the amount of waste caused by bad meetings. And that sparked us to have a, um, a really take a look at what's called meeting hygiene. And we had a just a, a meeting culture change that was sparked by that. So, you know, I don't know if I can offer up any tips other than you might talk to somebody that is uh, in your organization that is focused on spending or leadership and see if there's not something that you can do about maybe not this meeting, but just how you might more effectively handle large meetings like this. Um, yeah, I think the key to that money. is making sure that there's value provided in that meeting. So uh, the feedback mechanism is really important here. If you're running a meeting with 40 people, say every two weeks or once a month, make sure you're getting people's feedback in terms of what was valuable, what wasn't valuable. Um, I have to say, 
We have staff meetings once a month, and they are the best staff meetings I've had in my career. Our uh, HR uh, director, she's an all-star at this. Um, and I've been in some staff meetings that were just a total waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, so get feedback. Make sure you're delivering value um, to your audience. Yeah. I'm thinking it's like people going around a table and, and reading status reports. Not a good use of time. But you're right. Our monthly meetings are awesome, but they are production. Yeah, they're a production. Yeah. Okie doke. So let's see. Um, um, I'm just going to go through. We've got more people offering up their tips. So the next tip here, sending an agenda and setting expectations. That is yep. for sure a, a good tip. Attaching the supporting documents. This, I think, can be really important. You know, along with an agenda, sometimes there's some pre-work and we want people to be prepared. So making sure that you attach those. And hey, here's another bonus points moment. If you're wanting feedback on those, you know, back in the day, we used to attach the file to those invitations. And then how many versions of that document would you get floating around? These days, put that document in a shared location, share the link, and then let people collaborate through whatever that tool is. Yeah, so Paul Cash... Thank you. That's a that's another great one. Uh, let's see. How about? Um, oh, Sandra says, "Don't waste people's time inviting the world." Yeah, we got to <laughs> move people beyond fear of missing out, <laughs> yeah. right? If there are people that that want to know what was happening, tell you, I'll send you the notes, or I'll add you to the chat, and you can see the summary afterwards. So there's ways that you can make sure that people don't miss out. Um, and look at Sandra's uh, accomplishments there in terms of her certifications. Good job, Sandra. I know, you, you Sandra. Really my goodness. Really That's great. <laughs> Congratulations. That's a lot of hard work right there. Yeah. Um, all right. And also, she she added one more. And this one, I think, this, this is an interesting one. So recording the meeting. And I think that can be good. I do think you want to make sure that you ask for permission before you do that, because sometimes people get a little weird um, about what that recording might be used for. Yeah. 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 So. so Susan, let's talk about a few more additional elements that make up effective meetings. You know, um, you and I had a conversation leading up to this about deciding if you actually need a meeting, right? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. if you've got something that could be handled by chat or email, it might negate having to pull people together so you could deal with it offline. Um, another thing would be uh, looking at, are you running a workshop or you're doing some focus groups? Those are different styles of meetings that I would say are a little more advanced. What are your thoughts on that? Um I think that we may not think that our, our our planning could result in us asking the question, do I need a meeting? Because sometimes when we go into this, we think, well, I need a meeting. But sometimes you may uncover by putting together that objective that maybe a meeting is not really what you need. And um, and so, Scott, what you've mentioned are some other techniques that you can find in the business analysis body of knowledge that sound surprisingly like meetings, but in fact, they have it different outcomes. So, you know, a meeting is typically where I am going to maybe get status or get decisions made. Typically, it's decisions made. But if I want that meeting to that meeting to be a place where people are working, well, I really need a workshop, which means it may not be a one hour long thing. It could be longer. And I may need to do more preparation because I need to have materials ready for the groups to work on. Versus if I want a, a larger group of people and I want to uh, get feedback on something, well, that's a focus group. That's different. And so that's, you know, I'm going to have a di And so maybe sometimes I want to ask a whole bunch of people a similar question and you know to the point about having 40 plus people in a room and if, if I just want the answer to a question maybe that's a survey that's um, right. or maybe I would normally have a meeting but this week I don't have much of an update so instead I'll just put some notes into a slack channel or a teams chat or a an email and share the the you know the email that way so you can see that there's there's different ways where you might think about 
what it is you want to achieve and you could have things that aren't necessarily meetings as an outcome. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've got another element of a meeting and running effective meetings, and that's managing the discussion to keep it on track. Now, this gets into facilitation skills. Um, but if you've got a small group of people, let's just say three other people in the room, that's an easier task than if you've got a dozen people in your meeting. Um, so managing that group to keep them on the agenda is what you're trying to do. Um, there are ways that you can help manage that. So if someone starts to go down a little bit of a tangent that's off topic, um, you can use something called a parking lot list. So you can say, hey, we're going to take that idea. We're going to put in a parking lot list. We'll come back to it at the end of the meeting. But Susan, we also talked about um, when you're getting a little bit off topic, sometimes you can come across a really important topic. So the agenda that you had set out initially, um, you might want to adjust that agenda because of something that comes up, right? You might. And you know what, Katie, um, it, Katie was asking exactly this question. Uh, what what happens when they get off topic? Sometimes in your meeting, you may come upon a new issue or something that really comes out of nowhere. And it seems like there's a lot of energy or it's, or maybe there's a decision that needs to be made. Going back to that respect um, thing that we keep talking about, I think what you have to do here is ask the group, hey, Scott has brought up a really good a really good point here. It sounds like maybe we need to explore this a little bit. Does the group mind if we if we take a few minutes and talk about this? Let the group decide. Um, and yeah. then, you know, if the group says, yes, absolutely. Okay, well, then there may be some things on your agenda that don't get done. Be transparent about that as well. But let the group talk. Let the group decide. I, I think that's the best way to handle this. Maybe the group says, let's put it on the parking lot and, and schedule another meeting. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> sure. Put it in the parking lot. Decide if you need that other meeting, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I use what I call a floating agenda. So where I'm running weekly workshops, we're working through something. Um, what I'll do is start the meeting by saying, okay, what are the, here's what I think we need to talk about today. What are the other topics? So we get the group to agree on those, prioritize those, and then we get into the workshop. Um, so that's another way that you can use an agenda, but be dynamic in terms of what's most important to the audience. Yeah. Okay. So the next one here, um, we talked the, about this as well as sort of sending a summary to the meeting attendees. So you've taken notes on decisions, you've got the action items, but it's important to communicate that out. So there are different ways you can do this. Uh, traditionally, you might use an email, but there's more current technologies that people are adopting, such as Teams. What are other technologies, Susan, that people might use for that? Uh, we talked about Slack. Some uh, some folks use Confluence, which is um, you know it's just a it's a content management tool. You know, I think here's here's to me the the requirements for whatever that tool is that, that you're going to store these summaries. It needs to be available to all of the people in your organization because you want transparency. You want to be able to share things without having to make sure that so-and-so has permission to this or that. It should be searchable is another thing because I want people to be able to search and find it. Um, and it needs to be a fairly easy tool to use. Um, that can be a real barrier to taking, uh, to, to putting together summaries if it's a tool that nobody likes using. Yeah, so, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another uh, idea that we've got that we use here at IIBA is cameras on. So we run our meetings virtually. Um, it's really important that you're not staring at a bunch of icons on a screen because nonverbal communication in some cases can be stronger and more important than verbal communication. So in when you're in a virtual setting, make sure you're prepared to have your camera on. And if that's not something that your organization or the group you're working with has adopted yet, um, consider doing that. Adopt the rule, camera's always on. Uh, that way people can see, you know, are you falling asleep? Um, are you really concerned about something? Um, visual communication is really important in what we do. And because so much of our communication these days is virtual, it's important to, I think, even have a set of practices in organizations for how you want to hold those meetings. So yeah. cameras on. Um, and, you know, understanding a little bit uh, of 
that language. So I'm a note taker. And so in some of the meetings that I'm in, I spend a lot of time doing this. I'm not looking at my phone. I promise. I really have a, you know, but, but understanding what those behaviors look like and being transparent. Um, there's a whole visual language now that goes into our meeting, which we didn't have to worry about a million years ago, by the way, fun story. When, when our group put together our meeting guidelines, of course, everybody was in the office and we had a little short set for if you had conference calls, remember those conference calls, yeah. um, you know, and, and it, it makes me laugh now whenever I pull this back up, because it was things like, oh, when you get on the line, make sure that you state your name. Well, look, you, we don't have to do that anymore because <laughs> the, the meeting technology takes care of that. But, yeah. um, but, you know, having the camera on, I think is the best way that we can replicate, replicate human interaction in these meetings. And we are humans making human decisions. And so the more that I can know that you are, you know, present and real, um, the more that I, that we can do things like empathize and trust and all of those other things that are so critical to our job, but which are intangible. Yeah. That, that builds relationships in ways that not having cameras on do. If a camera is not on, I can't tell if you're not paying attention, if you don't like me, if you're not interested in the topic, if you, you know, don't want to be in this meeting. It says a lot of things non-verbally that I don't think you're, you're intending. So, yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, the last thing we had on our additional, additional elements list is uh, you can be a meeting hero if you end all of your meetings five minutes before the end of the meeting, um, it does a couple of things. One is if you're in a virtual world, it allows people to have a quick break. Um, if you're in a physical office, it allows people to move to the next meetings to make sure they arrive on time. Um, if you end right at the end of your meeting, uh, it just doesn't give people that that time that they need to transition. Yeah, I, we've given a couple of tips today that I think can make you a meeting hero. And again, those things that make you a hero, it's really about showing respect for the people that you're meeting with. Honestly, that's when you get known as somebody that has good meetings, it's because they start and end on time. People know what to expect. They know that you've invited the right people, that you're sharing the information. I mean, think about it. Respect, 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 build trust, all of those things. Yeah. All of that comes out of really good, what they call meeting hygiene. Yeah, yeah. Now, we do have some tool tips for you. I'm a, a woodworker. I love tools. So let's talk a little bit about tools. Um, visuals. When you're in a meeting, whether it's in front of a, a live audience or it's virtual, um, visuals are an important element. So whether you're using a whiteboard um, in physically in a room or you're using something virtually, um, you can use, you can share your word processor, your spreadsheet, a process flow, using that uh tool to be able to communicate what you're working through keeps everyone on the same page. So there's one tool that can help you out is share something visual. Another one is if you've got a large group and you've got a tight agenda, you need to work through it, get someone to help you with a timer. You know what? Our, our first agenda item is going to be 10 minutes. So-and-so, can you time it? And, and by having that conversation with that partner, um, it also helps keep the, the audience aware of, oh, we've only got two minutes left on this topic, uh, keep it going. So that could be a tool um, that would be helpful. And then the third one is um, virtual whiteboards. If you haven't tried this before with a group, um, I've done it a couple of times where we've actually, everyone can put a post-it note on a virtual board and then we can categorize those and move them around. Uh, a little bit of technology uh, can go a long way sometimes, depending on the purpose of your meeting. If it's something that fits, try out the tool. And you can go low tech and you can go high tech. And again, I think the difference is what tools are you comfortable with? Uh, I'm thinking about a talk that Rylan Layton did with us um, last year where we talked about context diagrams. And, um, you know, he is really comfortable with uh, this diagramming tool. And so he was able to pull it up in live, build diagrams. Well, not everybody can do that. Not everybody might have that tool that they, you know, that they feel comfortable with. So go for getting the, you know, the right content documented, however you document it, over having a cool tool to do it in. 
Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. And I think typing speed is something that I just take for granted um, that I can type really fast and I can move things around. Um, but if that's your typing speed isn't a strong point, maybe get someone to help you on that one. I'm a I'm a note taker, uh, and I and I I don't like lines. I'm also I, I'm an artist. That's with a, a lowercase a. I'm not actually an artist, but um, I I need the note taking both from a my typing distracts me and also just the tactile uh action right of of writing yeah. things down helps me to put it to memory that's yeah. just my thing and then i'll type it up later so know what works for you yeah yeah for sure so what type of questions have we got thrown out in front of us here <laughs> well that's what i'm taking a peek at here let's see all right so here we go Let's share one from William. William says, I like to establish norms in meetings for the appropriate tone. Um, I think having, yeah, you know, so I know there was a couple of comments today around contentious meetings. You know, how can you do that? Well, if you know that you are going to walk into a meeting that will be tense or you expect some sort of non-productive behavior, having norms at the top, having guidelines are really helpful. So for example, if it's a virtual meeting, you may say, okay, guys, everybody, you're turning your phone off and we're going to, you know, we're going to take some time and just talk through this or, you know, whatever. So, uh, so William, I think that's a, that's a great tip. Let's see. What else do we have? Here is a, here is a question. Oh, no, we talked about this one. Look at me getting off topic. Well well, Susan's looking at the various uh, questions we've got there, I'll just let you know about our next episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about chat GPT and business <laughs> analysis. Uh, we've got a lot of interest in this, um, so that you'll hear in two weeks. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Next question. How to course correct uh, when meetings take a detour to multiple strong personalities? Um, I've been in these meetings um, where um, my husband shows up. Uh, just out of the corner of my eye. Okay. So, you know, this one can be tough because sometimes we are, we are in a facilitation mode. Sometimes we are, we are not the highest job title in the room and this can be uncomfortable. Um, so I don't know what, what, uh, what ideas do you have? I think the this. context is really important for this. Um, in organizations where hierarchy is really important from a culture perspective, um, this can be a tricky one. And in that type of environment, you need someone that's got um, that same level of power. Um, so uh, someone who is lower in the hierarchy will have a difficult time in this type of scenario. They might need their boss or their boss's boss there to help manage that. But in an environment that is um, more level in terms of culture and, and hierarchy, um, I think it's um, it really comes down to facilitation skills, understanding what they're saying and being able to redirect the conversation. So this is what we're, if they're starting to go down a path that is creating some conflict or, okay, maybe that's a topic that we can take offline and we can have a separate conversation and then come back to the group. So there's a couple of different tips you can use there of we put in a parking lot, do we take it offline? The key thing is be respectful of everyone in the meeting. Um, so as long as you keep it respectful, you should be able to make that productive somehow. But if it erodes into disrespectful behavior, um, that's where your meeting's absolutely going to crash. Um, so it's important to keep it um, professional. Yeah, this this is one that that really can be tough. And and so look for your allies on this if they're in the room. Um, I have been in this meeting and we actually needed to just kind of take a break um, and just get get some people coordinated outside and then come back. So it's it's a tough one. This this requires advanced facilitation skills for sure. All righty. So let's see. And, and we are live today. So you do see Susan's husband in the background, <laughs> but that's part of what we do on video, right? You see uh, what's happening in our workspace. That's uh, right. Hey, that's <laughs> fun times. You never know what's going to happen on Business Analysis Live. That's why it's live. Okay, let's see. So what else do we have here? I've got, let's see, objectives might not be achieved 
on the scheduled time. So what, what could be the best practice? I think that's a great question. Um, again, I think transparency. Um, if, if you've got that agenda and people have, you know, people have been following along, you can say, hey, looks like our time is almost up. Doesn't look like we've got everything. So you could go a couple of routes. Um, can we schedule another meeting to wrap these up? That could be option one. Option two is, hey, could some of you that I need for the rest of this uh, stay on a little bit longer and maybe we can wrap this up and then you share notes with everybody? That could be another option. Yeah. What what have you what have any any tips for this one? Um, I like the one you suggest in terms of, hey, can we take a subset of those group and book a, a second meeting? Um, but yeah, it's it's things don't always go to plan. And it's not necessarily a failed meeting if you don't meet all the objectives. Um, the key thing is that you're making progress uh, and moving forward. And a key thing is also that the group that you're meeting with feels like they're making progress and moving forward. You know, you can have an agenda that only has two items on it. You can cover those, but if it isn't a productive meeting that people are collaborating and making decisions, it might not be successful. But you could have 10 agenda items on a meeting. You can get through eight of them and not the last two, but everyone can feel, wow, this was really good that we came together. We made these decisions and yeah, we've got a little bit more work to do, but great meeting. Let me say this out loud, because I think this is a really important point here. The success of a meeting is not the starting and ending on time. I mean, we talked about that. I think that's that's a way that we that we show respect and just good good meeting management. The success is what you are able to get done in the midst of that. And so you're right, even if you don't get to all those agenda items, but you've got good conversation, you've made progress, people are feeling satisfied with the outcomes. That's actually, I think, the 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 OKR um, that, that you want to achieve there. So, yeah, I think my most successful meetings when I get feedback at the end, because people do say to me sometimes, wow, that was a great meeting, are when I've got diverse groups together working on a process flow and we're dynamically moving things through where I've got finance and I've got sales and I've got operations together. And in as little as 30 minutes, getting those different people on the same page, um, frequently people say, wow, that, that's great. I now understand it. So it, it's great to hear that feedback when you've had those successful meetings. Yeah, that, that sense of camaraderie, the building of trust, the coming to consensus, those things that you, that are intangible, that is that is also about a successful meeting when people feel when people feel that way as opposed to just the deliverables that you produce it's it's a great point because there's always an art and a science to just about anything that we do and here's where meeting practice goes from the science surprising science to the art so maybe i need to give dr rogelberg a a, a call and say when are you going to write your surprising art of <laughs> of meetings <laughs> yeah yeah that's right because everyone has a different style they work in a different culture different organization different um places around the world people operate differently so yeah there definitely is an art to this uh, we're near the end here why don't we take one more question susan and then we'll wrap it up yeah that's that's what i was going to suggest uh, katie has another tip for us um I'd like to ensure that in my meeting request, the meeting title clearly exp explains the topic or type. This is a great tip. How many times have you guys gotten the meeting invitation that says Susan's meeting? Well, never if it came from me. Um, <laughs> uh, but here's where having a, 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 a name for your meeting that describes what you're going to do is it really sets the tone for what's going to happen in this. So this, Katie, is a a fantastic, uh, a fantastic tip. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All righty. So um, before we go, do we have any action items from today, Scott? Is there anything that I need to take away? Any decisions that we made I need to do anything <laughs> about? <laughs> well, you know, Susan, we've got this list. Maybe an action item that we can both do is maybe write a blog post for this and, and get it out so people can find it. Okay, I'm writing that down. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you and I will work on that. Okay. 
in the meantime, we are going to also be getting ready for our upcoming uh, live stream. It's Chat GPT and Business Analysis. Boy, uh, Chat GPT and AI has been all the rage. And I think a lot of our business analysis community wants to know what about us? What can we do with this? Well, we've got a special guest. It's Amal Bariali who's going to come. We're going to do a little bit of demo and a little bit of talking about uh, the possibilities of AI and business analysis. So we hope you'll join us. That'll be in two weeks, March 29th. That's a Wednesday at 1030 a.m. Eastern. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you soon. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and we'll leave another one right here for you to help you in your business analysis career. If you haven't subscribed to the IIBA YouTube channel yet, you can click over here and click on the bell icon to get notified every time we publish a brand new video.